All right, we're good to go. Thanks everyone for joining to the session about hardware onboarding and burn-in in the CERN data center. My name is Arne Wiebalk. I'm the cloud and Linux team lead in CERN IT. And just to introduce CERN briefly in one minute for those of you who have no idea what that is. So CERN is the European Organization for Nuclear Research. Our mission is to find answers to some of the mysteries of the universe. And in order to do this, we have built the Large Hadron Collider, the largest machine ever built by mankind, which is a particle collider 100 meters underground, 27 kilometers in circumference, where we collide particles, protons and ions in particular. And these collisions are then recorded and tracked by so-called detectors. We have four main detectors each, detectors, each of them roughly the size of a cathedral, 100 meters underground, each of them producing orders of like 10 gigabytes per second with this um, event data. This data is then sent into CERN IT. So you see here a screenshot of the, one of the main um, rooms in CERN IT where the initial reconstructions of these events happens where they are stored permanently and then fed into a worldwide grid of around 170 data centers worldwide, where a second copy is stored and where part of the analysis takes place. So this is CERN in, in one minute. Um, for this talk today, it's basically split roughly into two parts. So first, I want to give you like the big picture, like how actually hardware moves in and out of the CERN data center. It would be a little bit more theoretically. And then we would talk about the working horse that enables this, which is Arbronic. So new hardware in the Sun Data Center goes through several phases. So the first phase is basically from specification to delivery. When new hardware is uh, about to be bought, the ones using that hardware basically specify what they need. There's usually a meeting taking place, which is called the pre-specs meeting, where service managers express what kind of service they would like. Um, then these servers are procured, which is also a multi-stage um, process because we are like an international organization. This has to go out for, for tender. Vendors can apply, send their offers. And then at some point, the hardware is procured following the delivery instructions that we give and all the specification that we give. And then hardware finally arrives in the CERN data center. And you see on the left-hand side, this process takes about nine months from A to Z. So it's like quite a lengthy process and needs a lot of planning. Okay? And this is also one of the reasons why um, we introduced OpenStack in uh, 2013 in order to like, reduce the time until the service manager actually has resources. It gets a lot shorter. Now, once the hardware is there, it's, of course, installed physically, and then it has to go through a process called acceptance. So before we actually pay the hardware, it has to like, be checked. Is everything as we ordered? Does the hardware work? And so on. That takes a couple of weeks, depending on the server. So if you have a large disk server with 96 drives, for instance, and you need to go through burn-in, that may take quite a while to go through this. And then we keep hardware usually for something like five years, roughly. So it gets commissioned, it moves into production, so it basically gets to um, the, the service manager, to the various services that run their services on that hardware. We repair the hardware during that time, of course. We monitor it. And then at some point, after a couple of years, hardware gets decommissioned, it gets removed from all our databases, and then it's then physically removed and either recycled or offered for donation, because the hardware usually is still, still good. OK, so this is like roughly the whole process like in a, in a nutshell. And Many parts of this, or many components in this process, are actually driven by, by Ironic. So that brings us already to the second part, the working hose, the underlying working hose, Ironic as the bare metal management framework. So what is Ironic, for those of you who are not intimately familiar with it? The idea is to extend the cloud approach to bare metal servers. So basically, when we introduced it, we wanted to complement the offering that we have in our service where we offered already virtual machines and, for instance, uh, container clusters to also offer bare metal servers to our users using the same interface. Why? Because that simplifies a lot of the work that has, been, has to be done, like workflows, accounting, approval. All of this is the same whether you use physical machines or virtual machines. Okay? So Ironic provides a, an API service to interact with these physical servers. Originally, this was a provisioning driver in Nova and then was like moved out, but nowadays it can be either used, be used with OpenStack, this is the way we use it, so it's tightly integrated, or you can use this as a standalone tool, which also many deployments do. You can find a lot of details on the website, ironicbarematal.org. Uh, one important point, though, is that 
Ironic leverages um, open source standards and tooling. So many of the things that, or all of the things that Ironic actually uses are like open source and uh, open standards. It relies a lot on things like IPNI and Redfish and on Pixie and DHCP. But it also allows to, uh, for vendors to actually write their own plugins to make it more flexible. And also we have our own plugin, a CERN plugin that does certain things that we need at CERN. So Ironic basically, on a very high level, consists of three main components. There's a database where all the nodes, the physical nodes, are, are listed with their name, or which, for which we use the serial number in our case, in which state they are, what kind of credentials they have, and so on. Then there are so-called controllers, which are the service processes. There's an API, a conductor that acts on these physical machines. There's an inspector that can receive information about the internal state of a server, which components are in there. There's a message queue that and allows to exchange mess messages between these components. And then the third component is the IPA, it's the Ironic Python agent, which is an image with a daemon inside that is launched on these physical nodes. And with these three basic components, Ironic manages um, physical nodes. On the right-hand side, you say, see how it is laid out at CERN at the moment. So you see at the bottom, we have groups of, um, of 500 nodes, which are controlled or managed by one Ironic controller and then one Nova controller. And this way, the, the whole deployment is basically split. And the number here is around 20. So there are 9,000 physical nodes at the moment that are managed by CERN with this, with this system. Our initial use case was provisioning. So as I said, to give physical nodes just as virtual machines to the users. So provisioning was our initial use case. So you have the user which basically talks to OpenStack and then to Nova. Um, in order to get a physical machine. And then Nova, via the Ironic driver, talks to Ironic, and then with Glance and Neutron, basically pick a, a physical node, which is then given back to the, to the user. So this was the, the initial use case. But of course, um, physical nodes are not created. Um, they are just instantiated. Physical nodes are, are already there. Now, one of the things that we ran into like very early on is to have like universal images, and this is already the first detour that I take in my tour, uh, in my talk. Um, in order to not have different images for physical nodes and virtual machines, we worked a lot on having a single image that can handle both. And during that journey, we had a lot of or like various things that we needed to adapt. So it all follows the extend the cloud to bare metal um, paradigm still. So as I said, when you create a VM and if you instantiate a physical server from the user point of view and from the API point of view, it's basically the same. The first thing that we needed to add was GPT support. This was driven by very large um, servers for, for Elasticsearch, actually, um, where we needed to um, have GPT partition tables. Um, so we needed to add a BIOS boot partition. And then we had to move from UFI because the hardware colleagues um, preferred UFI for various reasons. Um, so we need to, to make the image UFI capable, um, which meant that we had to do additional partitions inside the image and could not rely on the MBR gap anymore. Um, we use extensively software rate, so we had to do something in our running and also in the image in order to enable software rate um, when deploying images on physical node. And then something rather recent is that we also have to like keep an eye on what to do with these software rates over time because there's some details that you need to pay attention to when you have a software rate for a longer time. So for instance, when you replace disks, um, you need to, for instance, relocate bootloaders and so on. OK, so another use case that we had is physical batch. And in the top left corner, it says back to the future. Um, so basically, what we did when we introduced OpenStack at CERN is that we moved our batch farm from physical nodes to virtual machines because we wanted to leverage, or the batch team wanted to leverage the APIs that OpenStack has in order to like, create workflows, OK? Now, with Ironic coming into the game, we actually had um, the opportunity to revisit this virtualization tax that we were paying. So we were like, accepting that there's a 3 to 5% loss in performance when using virtual machines over physical machines. And we basically moved back. So this is why back to the future. So we basically moved all of batch into virtual machines, run it as virtual machines for eight or nine years, and now we basically converted everything back to physical machines. And this was a big campaign, and you see on the right-hand side something, uh, some uh, screenshots of how the monitoring of Ironic actually sees this conversion back and forth. We used Ter Terraform as the infrastructure as code tool to interface with Ironic, so this is basically the batch team having, uh, using Terraform in order to um, talk to the OpenStack APIs in order to leverage all of this. 
So this is still provisioning, right? It's still the initial use case, giving physical nodes to, to users. But of course, there's a limit to this. Physical servers are not virtual machines, OK? That may sound like silly, but if you don't realize this, you, you will learn it the hard way. Hard way. So there are some limits of like, resources that you can um, provide. You cannot create physical servers out of thin air. You cannot create a physical server wherever you want. Um, the booting on bootstrapping, the debugging is more complicated. It may involve multiple teams, multiple skill sets, so it's a lot more um, complicated. The batch conversion that I just mentioned needed like weeks of cleanup of BMCs not working, nodes not booting for whatever reason, so it's a lot harder. And there's also less um, flexibility because a physical server is what it is, right? You cannot necessarily create a second interface card very easily. So there's also a talk um, by a colleague later this week by Marina um, who will like look at some of these difficulties explicitly. Now. <clears throat> This is the ironic state machine, and I have only 25 minutes, so I won't go through all of the bubbles here. <laughs> I will only go through the like, high-level bubble, which is basically, you have a node that's available. Um, it's being deployed, which means there's an instance that's created. Then it's active, which means there's an instance running, so it's an in-production server with an instance. Then it gets cleans and cleaned and becomes available again. Okay? So that's like the basic cycle for servers that servers run through. And I will mostly look at the cleaning part, because most of the things that, we're, that I'm going to talk about now, from now on, the burn -in or onboarding and burn-in, will be based on this cleaning step. We basically build most of the things into the cleaning framework of Ironic. So, this shows the whole life cycle of physical servers at CERN. Um, so you see there's like the preparation that's, that's taking place, then the physical servers are installed, they need to be registered, there's some inventory happening, some health checks, or like is there all the memory there, are all the CPUs there, are all the disks there, and so on. There's some burn-in um, where the components are stress tested, benchmark in order to make sure they behave as we want. Uh, some configuration like software RAID, their provisions are given to the user. There's some adopt step where you can like roll in production servers into Ironic. So basically trick Ironic. Um, uh, repairs, of course, have to happen. And at some point, they get cleaned and, and retired. Okay? And you see, like, I put the bear and most of them because I updated this slide over the past couple of years, and the bear is getting more and more full. And you see like most of the components or most of these steps are actually now handled by Ironic fully. So how does that work? So the generic work cycle for Ironic is basically like something triggers Ironic to do something on a node. So that was a very generic statement. So you have like, you have like the admin or some tooling that says to Ironic, hey, clean this node. Ironic checks on the databases and then talks to the node, usually via the BMC, so via protocols like IPMI or Pixie, and boots it into this image that I mentioned before um, with the IPI daemon, which then calls back home to, to Ironic, and Ironic gives the instructions of what, what to do, for instance, clean the disks. Okay? So this is the cleaning framework in a, in a nutshell, and this is basically what we leveraged for the things that we're, that we're doing. So, second detour. You see I like detours. BMC interaction I just mentioned. So one of the things that we, we are moving to is Redfish. So rather than using IPMI, which we've been using for a long time and still use a lot in the Sun Data Center, is that we're moving now more and more to Redfish. Um, why? Because it's becoming the industry standard. It has a lot of advantages over the traditional IPMI um, standard. So we moved newer deliveries into Ironic with Redfish. Um, we found a couple of issues um, in the various implementations. So implementation means on the BMC side how the Redfish protocol is actually, or the Redfish standard is actually implemented. So one famous um, thing that we had to handle was the e-tag handling, verifying that the state of the node is the same before when you last checked and when you send commands. Um, but the basic functionality is there, and you can handle nodes with Redfish. So we have like six or seven hundred nodes out of the whole park now that are totally handled with Redfish, and it works for our use cases, which is basically like all the cleaning, instantiating, and so on. Um, what we're currently working on is like moving this into the specification process that I mentioned earlier. So in the specification document that we give out for a tender, for companies to like actually um, to, to validate that their hardware is, um, matches our needs, we're looking into the interoperability profiles. So what is that? It's basically a list of things 
that you expect from a Redfish endpoint, and there's a validator that actually allows you to consume such a profile and tries it against the physical node, or in, in the Redfish endpoint in more general terms, okay? So in this profile, you can basically describe what you need, you give it to the tool, and the tool verifies that the hardware is actually doing the right thing. So this is the plan to have these as part of the specifications, and when we say like we want to buy hardware, it has to fulfill these kind of characteristics on the Redfish endpoint so that we're able to actually deal with it with Ironic. Now, the other question that we had around Redfish is like how users should um, interact with Redfish. And you may ask, okay, why users? So why do users need to interact with BMCs? It's very peculiar in our data center that users actually have access to the BMC credentials. So it's a relatively trusted environment, so users can actually talk to our BMCs. And also the repair team can uh, like talk to the BMC. That's not the case in all clouds, but it is the case in our cloud. So one of the things that we were wondering is like how to interact with the Redfish endpoint for, for, for IPMI, for instance, is the well-known IPMI tool. But what do we do with Redfish? So of course you can ask the users to use curl, but when I wrote the documentation, I realized that it's not going to fly very far because then it, it's getting complicated very quickly. Um, and also hits the limits of me editing websites with like um, quotes and stuff, it was very complicated. Anyway, there's like a Redfish tool, which is like a IPMI tool for Redfish, but it was only a temporary um, kind of stopgap um, solution. And there's the Redfish technical box, which is basically a set of tools that you can install in order to interact with, with the Redfish endpoint. And that seems to be working very well for us. Um, and I also would like to point out that the community is very responsive. There were a couple of issues where we said, like, hey, can we do this with the Redfish tackle box, for instance, see the service event log more easily? And they were very responsive and, and implemented this. OK, so much for the Redfish detour. So one of the things that we do now, like basically we go through this like big loop that I showed earlier. One of the first things that happens is like nodes are now auto-registered with all the databases that turn automatically. So basically the node switches on for the first time in the data center and then gets redirected by our DHCP server to Ironic, basically um, not to Ironic, but to the IPA image. So it boots into the IPA image for the first time. So you can see this over here, which then registers the node into our non-OpenStack network databases and sends the introspection data, so it does an introspection of this node, and sends the introspection data to Ironic, upon which Ironic itself learns for the first time about this nodes and registers the node with its own databases. Okay? So this is the enrolls new node step, and then also forwards this inventory data of this new server to S3, which is, in our case, on top of Ceph. Now, what do we do with this introspection data that I just mentioned? So this is basically the part up here. So there's like data that is going into um, S3, and then there's some enrichment with uh, benchmarking data. But in the end, you see down here this OpenDCIM. So we have our uh, data center and inventory management system based on OpenDCIM, where you basically can drill down from the room to the rack, to the quad, to the server, and then you can click and basically get that inter inventory data if you want to. And the inv inventory data that we collect per node is quite extensive. So you can basically see like all the disk, serial numbers, everything. So it's quite a large chunk of data that Ironic is able to, able to collect. So this is just to how this is embedded. Actually, I should have called this a small detour as well. Verifying that a server is actually looking the way it should can be done with introspection rules. So that's a feature in Ironic that allows you to describe how a certain server, or in our case, a whole delivery should look like. So you can say it should have that many cores, that many disks, this size, and so on. And Ironic will automatically check these and flag nodes where this is not the case. So imagine you get 1,000 nodes and there's like a couple of them where a memory module is missing. It's very hard to find this. In the past, we were basically sending this data somewhere and then looking at huge text files to see if there's any difference. You can do this with sort and org and grep, I see. I mean, we have done this as well. But introspection rules does that for you, okay? You describe this, and you can describe this per, per delivery. So you write the rules once, and then you basically let, let this run against the inventory that you get from Node. You can do this online, so the first time the Node sends it in. You can also do this offline and retrieve the data from S3 later on. Then after you're fine, all the components are, are there, we burn in the hardware. So basically we do burn in, in four stages. We stress the CPU, the memory, the disk, and the network. For CPU and memory, we use stress and G, and for disk and network, we use FIO. We use the same tool because that 
means that we have the same tool in the image, which makes the image a little bit smaller. Um, this is also part of cleaning. So there are cleaning steps that are also like um, added upstream where you can basically trigger these steps. Okay? This has all been released with, with um, Xena. And something that we had in addition is to watch what is going on in real time. So we have added to our IPI image a Fluent D daemon that actually, I was about to say live tweets what's going on, but it's basically like sending data into Elasticsearch and Kibana so we can actually see where the nodes are in their stages because some of these burn-in steps may take very long and you want to see if something is breaking and, and how it's going. Now, networking is a little bit more complicated because actually um, networking requires pairing. All the others you can do on a node, you just launch and basically run a script or run a command. Networking is more complicated because you need pairs. Okay? So we started with something like st static, so each node basically knew its counterpart and then both nodes were starting to clean, and then they were waiting. One, the first one was waiting for the other, and then they were basically burning. And this has a lot of some drawbacks. So for instance, imagine like one of the nodes doesn't show up, then the other one is basically waiting and timing out. So we quickly moved to what we call dynamic parent, uh, pairing. So we have a distributed arbiter in the back where nodes can just say, like, look, I want to burn in. And then someone else is someone else. Another node is coming up and say, I want to burn in as well. And then they just pair and go off and burn, in, burn them in. This has the advantage that you don't have to wait for nodes that are, for instance, in, in repair. All of this is all upstream. And we have tested this with more than 150 nodes in parallel. So 150 nodes sent into this. They go to Zookeeper uh, in the end and find their, their pairs. It works. Benchmarking also part of cleaning. So basically, what happens in the benchmarking step is that the benchmarking step downloads a container, um, in our case, a singularity image, runs a specific benchmark, and then sends the data into a pipeline with Elasticsearch and Kibana. And this allows us for different deliveries, so this is basically different processes, different kind of hardware over time, to see how the nodes are doing performance-wise. So you see, like, for most deliveries, you have a more or less nice normal distribution. But sometimes we had cases where you had, like, double peak structures, OK? And this allows you very easily to find nodes where something is wrong. So you have, like, a fraction of the nodes that don't behave well, and then you can, like, dive in and see what's going on. And at the very end, OK, the talk is called onboarding, but I also want to talk about offboarding a little bit. We also use Ironic for retirements. So basically, what we added to Ironic also upstream is the possibility to tag a node as retired. So what does that mean? Basically, initially, it doesn't mean anything. The node just carries that tag. It's an in-production server, which is retired. Um, but the moment the user deletes the instance, basically, the node does not go through the cycle anymore and goes to available. It goes back to management with a retired flag and doesn't move anymore. So you cannot use this for a new instantiation. So the idea is basically when we plan retirements and you saw that the cycle is multi multiple months, we can like one year in advance say, OK, this row of racks needs to be retired. We set the retirement flag. And then whenever the user deletes the instance, it will basically move the site. Okay? And then we can, at the very end, also like re-burn in. So usually before we donate servers, they are like tested again so that we don't like hand over broken nodes. But this is not something that we, we are doing yet. This is also well the bear, I hope, was like half. So all of this together allowed us to grow Ironic since we started in like late 2017 to, okay, the, the graph is not brand new, but trust me, it's like like around 9,000 now, so it's somewhere up here. And you can see some certain structures here. So you see like very steep increases here. So these are deliveries, so new hardware coming in. And you see it's like a couple of hundred nodes that are added. And then in between, there's also like, like smallish, either smallish deliveries or nodes that are added to Ironic. Um, equally, you can see retirement. So here's a retirement of well, it's like, like 1,000 servers. So that makes me, of course, very sad because the numbers in Ironic go down. But we're still, like, overall, we're still going up. And then we have something here, which is very steep, which is adoption. So this is like where we ran a campaign to add in production servers. So while they were being used under the control of Ironic, OK? So like a running mail server, rather than control the old way, is now controlled by Ironic. And we enrolled these nodes. Um, if you want to know how that works, there's a blog post on this. And I also recommend the talk that I mentioned earlier. I will also briefly explain this. If you want to know more 
about like how ironic is used at CERN. We have a blog where we post very often um, articles about how things, how we're doing things with uh, ironic and in general at CERN. And also a couple of videos um, that describe why we're using ironic in more detail, how we do the whole life cycle or how we scaled to, the, to that size. And with this, I'm done and happy to take questions. Thank you. So if you have a question, there's a mic over there. Otherwise, I would just repeat the question. So the question is whether we do this, provide this to users, or if we keep it all for ourselves. So I like to keep things for myself, of course. So we do both. So the OpenStack um, hypervisors are provisioned in Ironic, okay, which is a very nice loop. So the physical node um, that runs a hypervisor is an instance in Ironic, which is a hypervisor running the control plane for Ironic. Okay, so. Let that sink in. So, <laughs> but we also give this to users. So um, users in this case means um, mostly services within IT. So for instance, I don't know, the mail servers, um, the Ceph servers, the other storage servers, DB team, they get instances in Ironic. That's one thing. Um, also the experiments, so these physics experiments that I was mentioning earlier, they get sometimes need physical machines, for instance, because they need something that is performance-wise very stable. When they tune their code, they can't do necessarily with the VM because the optimization that they do is actually smaller than the fluctuation of the performance of the VM, so they can't really see things. Okay, so in that case, we also give them um, physical nodes. Something that we are like introducing now that I haven't mentioned at all is like multi-tenancy. So what we do with like specific deliveries is that we even give the users more power on the nodes. So, so the security folks are already scratching their heads because they have the, <laughs> the BMCs already. But um, with multi-tenancy, you can basically, um, Ironic has the concept of having owners of nodes. So when you have, for instance, a de certain delivery that goes to a specific service, like say the mail, mail team, um, and they want to have a specific rate configuration, you can basically give them the nodes and then this opens the API, or you can open the API to change certain things on the node. So for instance, do the rate configuration themselves rather than us doing it. Or they can drive a node through cleaning. So when they, um, if there's something wrong with the node and they get stuck in cleaning, they can fix it themselves. Or main use case, they can actually see how many nodes they have because there's no quotas for flavors. It's sometimes very hard for users to actually see how many nodes of which type can I actually instantiate because they only get cores and, and, um, and RAM. Um, and we have access to 20 flavors, but I don't know which is which, or which, how many of which can I, can, can I create. So this is one of the drawbacks of physical nodes. And with uh, multi-tenancy, they can actually see, okay, there's like 20 of this type and 10 of this type, and eight of these are instantiated. So the answer is we, we do both. Right. Right. So the, the question was whether we like um, considered other tools, um, like from this. Uh, well, there's other tools that we can. Uh, the answer is no. The short answer is no. Basically, because we had like OpenStack at the time, so for us it was very natural to look at Ironic at the next time. And once it got momentum, we basically rolled with it. We did not do an extensive study and compare this, for instance, to Ubuntu's, to Canonical's uh, MAS system or any other system. No. Right. So, so the question is whether we use whether the ironic that we use in order to provide the hypervisors is inside the same OpenStack deployment or if this is a separate OpenStack deployment. Actually, it's the same. So it's like one OpenStack deployment which has ironic, which also provides the hypervisors. Is the mic actually on? One second. Okay. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. A uh, couple of questions. Um, first, uh, how do you deal with uh, BMC passwords when they are, you know, nowadays often they are unique per, per node? 
Um, and uh, second question is, uh, do you rerun the performance benchmarks and reanalyze against the previous results to see if there was any regression in performance following maybe a BIOS firmware update or right. wearing of the devices? OK, so on the second question about benchmarks, the answer is no. So what we do is like um, we buy capacity by the metric is basically like performance per dollar, if you like, or performance per price. So we try to like optimize to get the most performance per dollar. And this is basically, so we roughly know what we should expect. And the benchmark is mostly to confirm that this is the case and also to give this to the experiment. So we basically give not course to the experiments, but basically the unit of this benchmark to the experiments. Okay? Um, what we do is um, we have for each delivery, we basically take notes aside, and they are continuously being benchmarked. So we can actually see if a new kernel or a new software library actually changes something um, so that later on we don't get surprised. We basically constantly monitor this with a small or a tiny fraction of the, of, of the delivery. The first question was about the BMC hardware. And, and the passwords? How about the passwords, yeah. Do you yeah. register them via uh, introspection rules or directly in the ironic database? Yeah. So BMC ha passwords, setting them uh, and resetting them, that's a hard problem. It's not that obvious to do. So the way it works is basically like initially um, hardware comes with password that we tell the vendors to set, and this is the, ha the passwords um, that we use initially. And then the passwords are set by an external tool, so it's not inside Ironic that does that. So that's basically like the, the hardware team that, that deals with this. So they have a separate database, and then they can manage the, manage the passwords via their tooling and then update Ironic. So Ironic is not the source of truth for the passwords. Thank you. There's one more question. Yeah, yeah, very good question. And um, so the question is like, how, how do we discover physical location? Okay, so my cloud answer to this is that physical location shouldn't matter, right? <laughs> this is what I tell like when people come to my office and say like, I want this server in this specific location. I say like, that's not cloudy. And you can imagine that they're super happy about this answer and say, ah, okay, very good then. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's usually not what happened. Yeah. So, um, the way it's done is, this is actually a problem as well. Um, so the way it's done is the way the network is structured at CERN is basically like mostly per rack. So when the node discovered in which, what we call an IP service, basically in which network it is, in which switch it is connected, it knows where it is. So this is roughly how it works. This is then reflected in the resource class, which is the tag that you use in order to do the scheduling, and also in the flavor. So users can actually see in the flavor where the node will go. But it's, it's, um, it's, it's actually a hard problem. And if you come to the other talk, you will see that it's uh, hard. Right. Um, we can use this. We, d we just didn't do this yet, but we can. Yeah. There's also LLDP. We didn't do like super sophisticated stuff. We, we started looking into this as well. But in most cases, I also try to insist that people should not care necessarily where exactly their server is. I said, like, look, we make sure we can like say it's in different availability zones. That should be enough. You should not rely on whether it's like on the top position of the rack or not. It doesn't work with all use cases. But yeah, it's uh, there, there's room for improvement as always. In the very back. Uh, one question about the images. You said there is a general image. Is what is the base of that general image? Is that shared or is that like security concerns for you? So the question is about the like um, the image that we have. I'm not sure. Is it shared between the hypervisor or the metal or uh, as a customer individual's image? Is there any what, what is it based on? No, it's a public it's a public image basically. So public to our users. Um, there's nothing special about the hypervisor image. So users instantiate their instances, virtual machines, with the exact same image as they do for physical nodes. So there's nothing. This is why we try to like extend the initial image that we had for virtual machines to be capable with physical nodes as well. One additional question: What, what image do you use for the ironic Sorry, say again. Uh, the base image for the ironic what are you using? Yeah, it's uh, Streamate. Center Streamate.
Yeah. So, so the question is about the networking. That's uh, very often a question, uh, like what we do about networking. So the networking at CERN in the Sun Data Center is very simple. It's like a flat provider network. So there's like the interaction that we have with Ironic to like Neutron, for instance, basically non-existent in our case. So basically, this is all cut short. So well, it's because of um, like historic reasons. That are, like are this infamous database that I mentioned. So Ironic does not really touch the network in our case. So, so it's just simple, uh, both the provisioning and the user Yes, permit. yes. So, so it's very simple, very straightforward. We, we were looking into like interact with Neutron, but so far there was no need. And when we started, actually, it wasn't, it wasn't needed. So in the very back. Right. So, so the question is about like how we validate that servers are collected, correctly connected network-wise. Is that your question? Yeah. Um, we don't validate this via Ironic. Um, there, of course, there are also visual, visual inspections, mm -hmm. and it's cabled basically by our team. So that's not part of um, Ironic validation for okay. for physical nodes. Okay. Okay. So it's more put to the hardware Yeah. Okay. okay. I think that's it. Thank you very much.